The views, information, and opinions expressed during the following program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent the views of Access Communications, its representatives, or its employees. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Weyburn City Council held in the Council Chambers at 6 p.m. Monday, October 23rd, 2023. The first line of business, well, our Council is all here tonight. The first line of business is the approval of the minutes of the regular Council meeting and strategic planning and priorities meeting held October 10th, 2023. Do you have a motion? I'll make that motion, Your Worship. Second. I'll second it, Your Worship. Discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Additions to the agenda. Mr. Warren? Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I have one addition tonight. It's under uh, motions. Uh, so 7A, Urban Highway Connector Program, uh, Expression of Interest. More, uh, number 7, 7A yeah. is... Uh, That's correct. Describe it again. It's the Urban Highway Connector Program, okay. Expression of Interest. Council? Seeing none, moving ahead, public, there's um, no your public. Your Worship, we'll need a motion for that. Do we have a motion to? Your Worship, I'll make a motion that we add 7A, the expression of interest for the Urban Highway Connector Program. Second. Call the question, all in favor? Carried unanimously. No public hearings and notices. Delegations, proclamations and petitions. Tonight we have the Weyburn Mountain Bike uh, Delegation representing uh, Trevor Tessier uh, representing it. If you would come forward, please, Trevor. Hi, uh, I'm Mike Mankabosh. We got Dave Hodgkin and Trevor Tessier here, okay. uh, representatives from Weyburn Mountain Bike Society or Weyburn Mountain Bike Clubs and uh, Weyburn Run Club, I suppose. And we're kind of, first off, we want to say thank you for allowing us to build trails over by the Tatagua trail system there. And we're grateful. We've been kind of in talks with you already, and you guys have always given us permission to move ahead. And, um, and you've also done some work in the past also out there, so we appreciate that. And I guess today we're just kind of going to give a proposal on maybe a bit of an ask on some work uh, to allow us to kind of build more trails and focus on that aspect instead of maintaining what we already have. I just want to describe what our club is. We are uh, dedicated volunteers. We are an official nonprofit group. We are affiliated with the International Mountain Biking Association. And in turn, that allows us um, better rates on our insurance. So all our, all our trails up on the hill are fully insured and um, the paper, all the paperwork's been passed on to Andrew, Director of Leisure Services. Um, and just want to reiterate, we uh, definitely appreciate the use of the land up there. It's it's kind of land nobody really uses. And now we see a lot of people up there on foot, on bikes. Uh, seen somebody on a unicycle up there a little while ago. It's, uh, it seems to be very popular anyway. Uh, so with that, I think we should just start with the video, if we could, could put that up. Step closer oh. to the mic, please. Yeah, if we could just start with the video. So maybe I just draw everyone's attention to the video here uh, displaying the trail system we have, um, which is over 0.16 a hectare. So we can play it. And maybe I'll have Dave just explain some of this here. Sure, I'll do my best anyway. I've ridden them a thousand times, I'm sure. That one of the wheels going around. So. That's, uh, <laughs> yes. That's that unicycle. Yeah, that's the unicycle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what happened when I tried to ride a unicycle. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. That's why I stick with two. Amen. <laughs> oh, if it doesn't play, oh, there we go. So right there you can see the paved Tatagua and to the right, you can see our trails that run through the woods. Um, really, there's not much I can explain other than anything you see that's not paved are trails that we make. Uh, right there, they're very clear. Uh, they're very non-intrusive without 
anybody maintaining them. Like if we don't have time and neglect the trail, uh, the grass just grows right back. We don't have anything permanent up there except for one small bridge that goes over a few rocks just to you know, play safe. We don't want anybody smashing. <laughs> Uh, all our trails are marked with difficulty ratings. Uh, we still have a lot more signage to put up, unfortunately. Uh, most of the work's done by myself and Mike and other people who have families and jobs and everything. So we just don't have enough time to get at it all ourselves. So with this, for these trail systems to be maintained and created, it takes about 80 hours every year to uh, work on them, with about 40 hours being just uh, maintenance of it. So with that being said, time for coming to city council, working on grants, or even expanding the trail system gets put on to maintaining it. And with that, there's a pretty significant group of people who use the trail system, whether it be hikers, mountain bikers, uh, or unicyclists, and actually just people walking their dog too. So just uh, in reference, Waver Mountain Bikers Club has 278 members, and Waver Run Club has 213 members. With that as well, these organizations do things outside of just these trails. Uh, they work with the kids to show them the area, and we've even had an agrologist kind of come and show some of the natural flora that is in these trails. If we scroll down a bit there, we, oh, oh, this one's from the past one, that's okay. So one of the things we did do is we looked around Weyburn to do an assessment of where are the mowed areas and where are, uh, where, how much mowing would we be asking for? Because the ask today is that we're asking for one hour per week between the spring and fall to maintain the trails with cutting the grass on them. And we have 0.16 of a hectare. So currently, uh, the city of Weyburn mows and cuts uh, where there's unused portions, uh, such as ditches and areas, of 14.17 hectares, which is about the size of Jubilee Park. We cut um, ditches and side roads or areas of grass uh, equivalent to what Jubilee Park is in around our ditches in Walmart and stuff. So I think one of the things we're asking is just, could we have those trail systems mowed? Uh, so then we can encourage more people to use them. And we would even, as opposed to calling the Trail Society Weyburn Mountain Bikers, we would change the name to Weyburn Trail Society to hopefully encourage it amongst other people as well. So that would be our ask here tonight. I, I, I'm wondering if we could pull up the, or did you, do you guys all have this presentation, which is different then? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was just emailed to council, so, so we just received it. So maybe if I just show you in this presentation here, we looked at how much mowing are we asking for, just in a perspective to Jubilee Park, and we highlighted it in this little white box. It's about the size of an outfield uh, in Jubilee Park, which is the size of our trails that we'd be asking to be mowed. So I just go to, so the ask is here, and I'll pull it over here. Yeah, we would, our ask is, is that if we could start mowing and maintaining those trails for one hour per week, starting in the spring and going until the fall, uh, and hopefully start that in spring of 2024. So today that is our ask, would we be able to get that? Thank you for your presentation. Questions from anyone? Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks for, first off, thanks for the trail system. I've used it a couple times. I've realized my age has impacted my ability to enjoy it as much as I maybe should. Uh, I love the whole thing up there. My question to you, and I, this is an impossible question, but if you have any sense of the volume of users that you see, and I know it's hard, it's no different than asking Andrew how many people walk the trails, uh, the Tatagua Trail, I get that. But do you have a sense beyond sort of Facebook uh, member. I'm a member of both those yeah. Facebook groups. You know what um, I mean? Well, I'm out there quite often. And like, yeah. you know, of those 80 hours I'm out there, uh, I would say 70 of them, I see at least one other person. But then there's also like an <coughs> entire family out there. And you do see people come up from the trail through there and they're walking the trails. They're not just passing through to the parking lot. So I do see 
I would say from one to three people out there, 80% of the time I'm out there. And I'm out there quite a lot during the summer. So fair enough. I would say quite a bit. And yeah. representing Weyburn Run Club, we run there three times a week for at least an hour uh, a day. So I guess the, you know, three times a week for an hour kind of thing too, and in groups of eight usually. Uh, and if anyone's willing or wanting to join, we run on Thursday night at 7 p.m. and sure. Saturday at 8 a.m. So <laughs> just to keep it in mind. Sure. Thanks, guys. Well, I just want to add one more thing. Yeah. As, as far as volume, it seems every time I go out there too now, I'm seeing more and more families, more and more kids riding the trails and getting feedback from people I know that they have their kids out there and they're loving the trails. Thank you. Thanks. First off, guys, thank you again for what you do. You're an example of what, uh, what clubs like that can become when everyone's willing to put a little time and a little elbow grease into it, so well done. Um, maybe an easier question to answer is, you've alluded to, is usage trending up? Like are you seeing yeah, more people yes, progressively more out more there? people all the time. Because I think, I mean, that's really what we're looking for, right? Yeah. And what, uh, what time of year do you do this? Like, is it all year round or is there a season or? Well, it's almost over now. <laughs> <laughs> Typically over the winter time, we get out there and we'll try and snowshoe and pack the trails down. Uh, so we can either walk or fat bike them. Um, sometimes we'll get out there with our cross country skis as well. Are you asking because you're wondering what your commitment will be, like how long that'll be? Or are you asking just because? I'm really more curious about usage. Yeah. I mean, not, not that it hinges on this at all, but right. I mean, are people out there just from uh, April to November or do you get out there all year round or? Yeah, well, there are, there's a, we run it all year round. So yeah. like, you know, we either use the paved trail system or run in there uh, with cleats and stuff like that. So uh, from the run club perspective, all year round, um, but it wouldn't need to be maintained by the city because we pack it ourselves for the ones who are dedicated in the winter. So, but definitely trending up. I Excellent. see more and more people there all the time. And much like Mike, I'm out there five or six days a week. Awesome, thanks a lot guys. I guess, oh, go ahead Don. Thanks guys for the presentation, really appreciate it. Um, I'm, the, I believe you mentioned that you put in about 80 hours in maintenance through the course of the year. 80 I, hours of volunteer time would be the, dedicated towards the trails with both expansion and maintenance. And maintenance is about that 20 to 40 hour mark, yeah. depending on the year. Yeah. Could this you just was a little more. describe to us what that entails as far as maintenance goes and uh, what part and how many people do you have in the club that actually that are part of that maintenance maintenance group and uh, what other aspects the city provides to you? And maybe I wanted to comment on that is that Dave and Mike are trail building experts. They're the best in the town and probably we create some really good trails with what we have out there. So generally speaking, these two do the majority of the work on the trail system. So they have to do, they do a significant amount of maintenance as well as trying to do the expansion of it. So that that's where the challenge comes in because in, for the most part, they've been doing that uh, alone and without support uh, other than the ability, the space uh, that it was given. And then in previous years, there was a little bit of cutting of the grass. Yeah, yeah so like the low skill maintenance would be cutting the grass. There's, we have the numbers here. A good portion of it, you can get in there with a the riding mower and just cut once and it's done basically. Uh, we don't have a riding mower, so it takes us more time. It also pushes the weeds back a bit because some of those weeds in some of the trails get high and then they kind of lean in a bit. So the riding mower could just push those back. So that's that takes up a, bu a bunch of the time. And then building a new trail, we kind of do that. And then we really try to get down to the dirt so it stays hard and uh, um, like a nice surface, I suppose. We, we remove the veg vegetation and then we will shape the trail. We will dig it up with pickaxes and shovels. And we do it all by hand right now till we find some um, sponsorship from a Manils or something like that, but dig it all out by hand, shape it, shape it into berms, make things so they're not off camber, make it so when you do go ride those trails, you're not gonna just fall off the edge of the trail into the into the woods, remove the rocks, remove any nasty tree branches in the way and, and those sort of things. And then as far as trimming, we spend from April to July, mostly just doing trimming. Most of our building doesn't come until, until the fall time when the, uh, when the grass stops growing so much, basically. 
So it's a small group of people that are Small maintaining. group doing the maintenance, larger group yeah. utilizing it. Well, I applaud your dedication to, <laughs> to the project for sure. We, we go a little insane if we don't have <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Mr. Von Bitzer. What you're looking for from the city is the grass cutting? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just looking at the layout and everything, I'm just wondering how it's different for you guys to go out there individually and cut with the lawnmower than it is for us to send an employee out there yep. up and down around the hills. And I'm wondering how possible that is or how safe it is to send a, yeah. a, a staff out there and yeah. do that. Last year, um, I believe, was it last year that they did our main, we have one main trail that feeds everything. It's, it's a green trail called It Begins. And last year, uh, parks, I guess, had some extra time or extra manpower. And they went through and mowed that every two weeks or so. And then we took care of the rest. Yeah. And so a riding lawnmower will work on a trail like that and a few of the existing trails that were up there that we've taken over. And um, other than that, it would be a push behind whippersnapper. We used a, you know, a powered one, but one of those push behinds would make short work of it. Okay, thank you. I guess my question is, Andrew, this is your area of operations? Okay, pardon me? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is, yeah. Okay, and so you, and you did some already last year for them? Or? Yeah, so what we've been doing since Dave came to us back in 2020, I think it was, yeah, when we first approached the city, uh, with his idea for the bike trails is um, basically we have a meeting at the start of the year, um, and then they have our parks managers on speed dial, and if they ever require anything from us or if they have some plans at the start of the year, they'll meet with him. Um, and then they may have touch points throughout the year if they need, but they'll meet with him and try to figure out, okay, we want to do this. What can you guys do to help us? And then we try to fit in as much as we can with, uh, whatever resources we have that summer. Problem is our resources kind of change from year to year. Uh, we're so dependent on seasonal staff and, uh, the nuances of what spring and summer can be. So, uh, we just kind of play it by ear and do what we can as we can. And we completely understand how um, staff shortages go and budgets and such. And that's why we came to you at the end of the season to look forward for next year. And we definitely appreciate everything that Andrew's done. He's been 100% helpful. Same with Curtis right from the start. You're a registered nonprofit, right? Yes. From that, we'll, uh, any other questions? So thank you for your presentation. Leave it thank with you. us. and. Uh, uh, Andrew and Matthew will discuss matters and it's brought to our attention and we'll go from there. That's good. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just for if there's any future reference with the proposal, that one's our past one. So please reference this one. And if there's any required information aside from this, as we did do a land area analysis of all areas mode in the city, and we'd be happy to share that in comparison to what we're asking for. So thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yes. sure. No reports of standing committees. Consent agenda uh, is that we have just one here tonight, the building department report for September. We do have a motion, please. For all new. We'll, uh, I'll make that motion, Your Honor, that the cons consent agenda containing the September building department report be accepted as presented. I'll second I, that. Uh, I was going to just say, I appreciate the, you referring to me like a judge, but it's your worship, oh, not your honor. Nice. Your honor is reserved for the judges. <laughs> this is. Uh, he does give judges. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, but that is that is the, that is the judges, yeah. not the. Uh, it's your worship here, so uh, go ahead. I will second that, your worship. Uh, call the call the question. All in favor? Terry, you know. The, I was just up and watching the swearing in of a new lawyer, and it was your honor there. And I'm going, yes, that's that's the judge's realm. Uh, motions, uh, Mr. Warren, 7A, Urban uh, Highway Con Connector Expression of Interest. Yeah, our Director of Engineering, Jen Wilkinson, will speak to that tonight, Your Worship. 
Thank you. Uh, so the city of Weyburn is providing an expression of interest for the Urban Highway Connector Program, UHCP, through the province of Saskatchewan. The Urban Highway Connector Program promotes safe and efficient movement of people and goods through Saskatchewan cities. It also provides an open and consistent framework to support the municipal management of urban highway connectors. Saskatchewan's 16 cities control urban highway connectors within their boundaries under provincial legislation and jurisdiction. These connectors are roadways connecting highways through the cities. The Ministry of Highways and Infrastructure is requesting expression of interest that will identify priorities in each city for urban highway connector improvements. Any funding under the UHCP will be driven by the provincial budget process and, complete, and compete with uh, Ministry Highways and Infrastructure priorities. The City of Weyburn has identified four projects as a priority for the UHCP. Priority one is to rebuild the intersection of First Avenue and Government Road slash King Street and repave First Avenue from the intersection to Second Street. Priority two is to remove the damaged asphalt surface and repave First Avenue from Second Street to 13th Street. Priority three is to remove the damaged asphalt surface and repave King Street from 1st Avenue to 5th Avenue North. And priority four is to remove the damaged asphalt surface and repave 1st Avenue from 13th Street to 16th Street. All these locations are part of our truck route and see a lot of heavy truck traffic. These areas are showing significant surface damage and have not had any major work done in the past 10 years. The city does a pothole patching program on both roads every year. We want to repair the surface before we see damage to the subsurface and base. Both areas are a level three in terms of our UHCP agreement and would receive up to 70% funding from the government of Saskatchewan. So as you can see, I have included um, maps for all the four priorities. In order to move the expression of interest, the government of Saskatchewan requires a resolution stating City Council agrees to meet legislated standards to meet the terms and conditions of the UHCP program, to conduct an open tendering process, to manage the construction of the project, to fund the municipal share of the project, to fund ongoing operation and maintenance costs, and to follow any mitigation measures as required by the Federal Impact Assessment Act and the Environmental Assessment Act of Saskatchewan. It is recommended that the Weyburn City Council provide the province of Saskatchewan with the required resolution for the UHCP expression of interest for priority one, two, three, and four projects. Do you have a motion, please? Your Worship, I'll make the motion that City Council support the expression of interest to the province of Saskatchewan for the Urban Highway Connector Program to allow for the following projects in order of priority for the City of Weyburn. Number one, the intersection of First Avenue and Government Road slash King Street East to Second Street. Number two, First Avenue from Second Street to 13th Street. Number three, King Street from First Avenue to Fifth Avenue North. And number four, First Avenue from 13th Street to 16th Street. I can second that, Your Worship. Discussion? Jennifer, oh, okay, go ahead. Yep. Just a, um, one question, Jen. Um, on priority four, mm -hmm. um, why is it only 13th to 16th and not 13th to 18th? Basically, we would be butting up to where we completed the intersection work right now. And not continuing past there? Uh, at this time, no, we haven't identified that. Um, not to say that it couldn't change um, when we, they've asked that we can, we usually only get to submit two and they said we could submit up to four. Chances of us right. receiving the fourth right now are slim that it could be adjusted before then. Okay, thank you. What is our portion percentage wise? So we would pay 30% on these projects. Every one of them would have a up to 70% um, cost to the ministry. So very important to get this grant. Yeah, this grant uh, is, is very useful for us. It's how we were able to do the um, First Avenue and 16th Street intersection. It was the same program for that. So now we are continuing on where we provide expression of interest to the Ministry of Highways every year. And um, we have actually submitted the top two, or we've submitted project one and three before. Um, 
project one and two were sort of combined, and then we submitted project three as well. So we've submitted these previously to the ministry. So we keep, um, we will submit the same ones again so they understand that our priorities haven't changed. Any other questions? So we have a, uh, the motion is on the floor. Call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. The introduction of bylaws, uh, bylaw 233465, dog and cat bylaw amendment. Lynette. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, so uh, earlier in the year, the police commission had uh, discussed uh, the dog and cat bylaw and um, recommended that uh, council look at the bylaw uh, just to provide some clarity uh, around some wording, um, specifically uh, on the number of dogs and cats permitted, not the number so much as just the wording around how to um, enforce that bylaw. Uh, per previously, it had said um, no person shall possess three dogs or cats um, but the intent of the bylaw has always been per household not per person in the household so we just wanted to clean up that wording so that was just one of the um, the recommendations from the police commission and then just uh, um, also the police commission just asked that uh, the police chief the bylaw officer and myself the city clerk uh, just have a look at um, kind of enforcement under dangerous uh, dogs and cats. Uh, so after some review, um, the police chief, the bylaw officer provided me with a few recommendations. Uh, so some wording was updated to um, add in um, where if an animal was to attack or bite a person to also add in domestic animals. So if an animal attacked one of your pets, they would also be considered uh, dangerous under this, uh, this amendment. Uh, then just some other wording uh, to allow for a judge, uh, if it went to court, um, to be able to um, declare if an animal is dangerous, if it bites um, a person or you know, att attempts to bite or seems to be um, ferocious in any way. Uh, so some of these items um, were included in this amendment. Uh, then there was also just one um, portion added under uh, miscellaneous and fences. Um, I'll just read the portion that um, the police chief had recommended. Um, if at the time of the offense, the owner is not available to stop a continuation of the offense, the animal control officer or any peace officer may seize the animal and deliver such animal to the pound. All dogs or cats seized and kept in the pound shall be confined for a period of 72 hours, if not claimed and repossessed by the owner, may be sold for the cost of boarding. If such impounded dog or cat is not not claimed and repossessed or sold within a period of 72 hours from the time of impoundment, the said dog or cat may be destroyed or disposed of at the discretion of the person designated by the mayor or city manager. The owner shall be required to pay the cost of pound fees before the dog or cat may be re, um, repossessed. Um, so basically, um, we're just, you know, uh, I, I would recommend that council uh, give this uh, this uh, pass this amendment and uh, could provide up to the three readings tonight if they so wish, um, and then we would those by that bylaw would uh, be amended effective after the third reading of that bylaw. Do you have a motion, please? Thanks, Your Worship. I would motion that bylaw 2023-3465 to amend bylaw 2006-3073, the City of Weyburn Dog and Cat bylaw be read a first time tonight and brought back to a future meeting for second and third readings. Your Worship, I'll second that motion. Discussion? Thank you, Sir Worship. Um, I think it's really important that we do bring this back to a further meeting or a meeting in the future, just so that the public has the opportunity to weigh in on any concerns they may have, um, and that council has the opportunity to ask some questions on how this is going to be enacted in the future. Call the question. All in favor? First reading is passed, and this will be back, brought back to which council meeting? Uh, the next meeting is November 13th, so I can bring that back to that meeting if council so wishes. Okay. We so wish. <clears throat> Bylaw 23-34-67, zoning amendment, Sir well, uh, school property. We have a second and third reading. Do you wish to uh, 
And just before I do this, there was uh, the, do you wish to do the staff report here again, or you've had already the staff report? Would you like me to go through it, Your Worship? Uh, I believe we had it uh, last time. If you want to just hit the highlights, just that we're changing the zoning from which zoning to which zoning. I can go through that, Your Worship. Um, so we have a request uh, from a number company um, to have uh, 316 uh, Fifth Avenue Southeast uh, rezoned from an R2 to an R3. Um, so we did uh, a public notice on this um, after our first reading on September 25th uh, to a raise to 75 meters. We also provide notice to our district planning commission. I uh, received no objections or no, no responses from both the district planning commission or from the public. Uh, so a little background on this property. In February of 2023, the Southeast Cornerstone School Division sold the parcel. Uh, to the applicant. Uh, the site is the former location of the sewer school and the applicant plans to build a multi-level senior residential care complex on the property, which is permitted within the R3 zone. Okay. Uh, Danette, and give an ex explanation if you were, because we are going to do a public hearing on this bylaw and the, on the bylaw we put a side on uh, the dog and cat bar, well, there won't be a public hearing, difference being why? Uh, basically, Your Worship, um, the uh, anything to do with uh, zoning, um, and, and not always with zoning, but in this particular case, um, the Act, the Planning Development Act does require for us to do a public hearing, whereas in the dog and cat bylaw, there is no requirement under any legislation where we would have to do a public hearing. So we will have to do a formal public hearing tonight for this particular bylaw as per the Planning and Development Act. With that being said, I now declare this public hearing open and invite any parties wishing to speak regarding the bylaw you may uh, come forward now at this time. So this is first call. I ask a second time, this is second call for anyone who wishes to speak to this bylaw, 2320, 23, 34, 67. Third and final call, for anyone from the public who wishes to speak to bylaw 20, uh, 23, 20, 23, 34, 67. Seeing no one, I declare this hearing closed and we can proceed with second and third reading. Do we have second reading? Your Worship. I would move that bylaw 2023-3467, a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 2020-3412 for the purpose of rezoning the property at 316 Fifth Avenue Southeast, parcel number 10891527, block C, plan 90R56781 from R2 residential semi-detached to R3 residential multi multiple housing be read a second time. I can second that, Your Worship. Discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. If you would, please. Your Worship, I would move that bylaw 2023-3467, a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 2020-3412 for the purpose of rezoning the property at 316 Fifth Avenue Southeast, parcel number 10891527, block C, plan 90R56781 from R2 residential semi-detached to R3 residential multiple housing be read a third time and passed. I'll, Your Worship, I'll second that. Discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Moving forward, we have another zoning amendment. Uh, bylaw 2023 20, 2, 68 NC to R2. And Mr. Warren will speak on it, and we will do first reading only. Okay. Your Worship, if I may, I have to declare conflict on this one, and we'll recuse. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, so we have a zoning bylaw amendment application from Bree Patterson um, requesting that the property located at 343 Second Street be rezoned from NC, which is neighborhood commercial, uh, to R2, which is residential semi-detached. 
Um, so if uh, council proceeds with first reading of this bylaw tonight, um, we'll send out a public notice uh, and then we'll come back for a public hearing on November 13th at a regular scheduled council meeting. Uh, so in October of 2017, uh, this property was rezoned from R2 uh, to um, the NC, so Neighborhood Commercial. Uh, the reason for the amendment was at that time to allow um, that to be converted uh, to use of the existing commercial. Um, and now she's asking to have it moved back from that back to res residential use. Uh, so I do have a map of the property and location of the property right in the corner of the street. Uh, so within the zoning bylaw of 2020-3412, uh, the applicant has requested the land be rezoned from the R2. Um, the R2 zone uh, permits semi-detached uh, dwelling units um, permitted in the R1 zone while re recognizing the demand for conversion of older, larger detached dwellings to rental housing. It's uh, designed to uh, conserve the general character of the established neighborhoods and encourage the renewal of existing housing. The following is listed of permitted uses, uh, which this request is uh, within the R2 zone. Uh, so council has two options in front of them tonight. So option one is council give first reading of bylaw 2023-3468, being a bylaw to amend the zoning bylaw to rezone the aforementioned lands from N NC to R2 and direct administration to advertise the bylaw uh, as per a public notice policy. And then option two is to refuse, and if there's a refusal tonight, to provide that back to the applicant. Uh, so a recommendation from council that council gives first reading of bylaw 2023-3468 to amend the zoning bylaw as mentioned above. Your Worship, I make a motion that bylaw 2023-3468, a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 2020-3412 for the purpose of rezoning the property at 343 2nd Street Northeast, lots 1, 2, and 3, block 75, plan S4840 from Northwest Neighborhood Commercial to R2 semi-detached to be a first to be read a first time and then staff be directed to advertise bylaw 2023-3468 as per the public notice policy. I'll second that, Your Worship. Discussion. Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. So that will come back again roughly when? Uh, Your Worship, they'll come back on the November 13th meeting. Okay. Unfinished business. Uh, Your Worship, we need to get uh, Councillor Janky back. Okay. Yeah. Unfinished business, there is none. We're going to new business. This is our preliminary budget, uh, I guess, disclosure to the public on this. Is there going to be a date of open house afterwards, Matthew, set or anything? Yeah, Your Worship, I'll go through in the presentation. So we're looking at an open house on November the 7th. Uh, there'll be two times for that, one at 11.30 till 1.30, and the second will be from 5 till 7. Uh, we have not determined the location. Once we do, we'll advertise that immensely so people know where that is. Okay. I'll uh, turn it over to... Uh, Financial uh, Finance Director, Ms. Howell, if she would be so kind as to give us this presentation, please. Yes, thank you. All right, so um, the preliminary budget has been um, submitted and put together. Um, we've based it on our what the visions were for the city that were passed um, as a community for all the mission, growth through opportunity. So the preliminary budget, um, it primarily deals with the municipal budget and this serves as an outline for how the money that comes into the city should be spent to maintain and improve the city. The strategic plan that council has put together um, and their direction and priorities to establish the guidelines for the initial steps in preparing the annual operating capital budget. And as Matthew said, we are gonna have a public engagement on November 7th and that will be communicated. So we did have a, a citizen survey in the fall, or sorry, in the spring. And um, based on that, we took some of the, 
the feedback from that into account. So what we did see is economic development was a big um, trigger for people to reduce city spending, maintain and increase capital, and increase our level of service. So as in the past, we do um, have a balanced budget approach. Um, we maintain tax policies to keep the city competitive. We balance the ratepayers' interests um, with continued growth. We balance the department's requests to continue our, to have a high level of service and programs. We address maintenance and replacement of major capital, and we set out short and long-term plans, and we try to manage to increase our supply and capital costs. Um, so we added this um, slide this year that shows our um, org chart of how the budget is. So at the top, there's the city budget overall, and we have three different basically revenue streams or three different funds that um, the budget is based on. So our general operating, this is primarily funded through taxation and grant money with a little bit of fees. Um, so throughout this it shows that general government police services fire services planning and development leisure services parks engineering public works facilities fleet and the infrastructure revitalization program are all funded through the general operating then we have our utility operating and capital and this is our water and sewer services and our water treatment plant so these are primarily funded through fees and grants and then we have our landfill, and this is primarily funded through fees and some grants as well. So our revenue sources. Um, so as I just said, the general operations of the city are funded through primarily through tax revenue and grants, and the utility functions are funded by our user fees, and that would be what we collect on our utility billing, landfill fees, and some capital grants. So for 2024, our general operating um, is gonna be funded, we're looking to fund it through property taxes and the grant and lose of just over 13 million, and that makes up 59%. Um, our grant funding is just over 5 million, and that's 23%. Fees and charges are just under 2 million, which is 8.77%. Reserve funding of 1.2 million. Um, investment income and other is just under a million. So that makes up 22 million for our general operating. Our utility fund, um, that is primarily through fees and it would, it's budgeted just over six million. So that shows 98% um, of our revenue. Grant funding is 100,000 and some reserve funding is 7,000. Uh, 7, so our operating and utility capital funds these funds are primarily um, funded through our reserves and um, through transfers from our operating, and that's just under eight million. So our tax dollar allocation, so this is just our general operating, so where do your tax dollars get spent? Um, so Public Works, they primarily use 16% of our tax dollars, Engineering's four, Parks is 6.7, Leisure Services 27%, Fire is 6.4, Police is just under 21, and Finance and Admin is 16.7%. So that what we have right now is an increase in taxes of 6.47% and that's $650,467 in additional revenue. Um, so of this 650,000, leisure has an increase of 325,000, police is 228, engineering is 185,000, public works is 136,000, parks is 108, uh, fire is just over 10,000 and um, planning and development actually has a reduction in their budget of 6,000 and admin and finance has a reduction of um, 336,000. So admin and finance, the reason it's lower this year is because last year we had some transfers going out to other departments to fund other departments and this year we have less so that's why it's lower. So the 2024 operating and capital, this does not include the utilities. Our operating budget is 22,265,000. Our capital budget is 2.8 million, so a total of 25 million. Um, it shows we have transfers to our reserves of 300,000, operating to come out of our reserves of 395,000 and capital funded by reserves of just over 1.8 million. So a total of 25 million. 
Um, I won't go into every detail on here of our general operating fund of the revenue and expenses, but it shows um, where we budget this year, all of our um, revenue and expenses and the equipment and, or sorry, the capital that we plan on um, purchasing. On the next slide, it has our capital. So um, police is looking at purchasing a new vehicle or a new fleet, um, fire, some breathing apparatuses, public works, um, improvements of asphalt, traffic lights, the message board, culverts, and a storm line, uh, modeling the storm water and sanitary system, This and also looking at the um, upgrades to the storm water and sanitary systems. And then Parks has um, Tatago Trails the boardwalk replacement. So that's what makes up our 2.8 million in capital. So within our general operating, we have a facilities fund, a fleet fund, and the infrastructure revitalization program. These three funds are all funded throughout the general operating. So they have transfers that go into um, this fund to fund it. Um, so that's where you'd see like an internal transfer to other departments or internal transfers to fleet within the budget. So um, the operating budget within these is just under 3.5 million and the capital is 660,000. Um, so within this, these three, um, this fund, these three funds, the fleet capital that we're looking at is a truck for 80,000, a tandem dump truck for 220, a sweeper for 500, no, 365, and a new mower. So that makes up their capital of 715,000. So the utility and landfill, um, so these ones are funded through user fees primarily. Their budget is the utility and the water treatment plant is just over 5 million and the landfill is 1.3 and their capital is 4.3 million. And within here, um, they have um, their capital is, um, so our treatment plant, or sorry, the water replacement um, is 200,000 and, sorry, 400,000 at two different spots. And the lift station upgrades are 1.2 million. The plant upgrades at the water treatment plant are 1.7 million. And the um, construction of phase one of the engineered cell is a million. So that's what makes up the 4.3 in capital. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So uh, now I will go through um, uh, two of the departments I oversee. Uh, so the first one I'll go through is our administration. Uh, so highlights for uh, last year or for this year uh, is one implementation of our e-bidding. Um, so we do bids and tenders now for all of our procurement. And it's been working out quite good for us. It's been helping our bidding processes. We'll be continuing to do that next year as well, but it's been a good highlight this year for what we've been doing. Uh, improve emphasis on community engagement. Laura did touch base on our community survey, um, you know, through all the work that we did through our strat plan, um, you know, the reach out we've done through uh, what we're gonna do for budget. It's all been really important to hear what the public wants us to look towards as a municipality. Um, we do funding towards the Women Humane Society for animal control and facility operations. Uh, our Wayburn Builds program, a commercial incentive program. Uh, we're trying to incentivize both residential and commercial and, and help us grow as a community. Uh, and then we looked at established uh, new IT uh, contracts. So that just happened. We re-upped with WBM again. Uh, so 2024, uh, so a big thing we have um, is our municipal election. So that comes up in November of next year. So we're a little under 13 months away from that. Uh, implementation of a records management system. Uh, for us, we always wanna be innovative in what we do and make sure that we track what we do uh, moving forward, everything that we do within our operations. Uh, we have uh, new council chamber desks uh, as requested by council to re-up what we do within this uh, council chambers. Uh, I already talked about engagement. We want to continue to do community engagement. It's really important to what we do as a municipality. We want to continue to do our funding that we do for the Weyburn Humane Society. Also want to continue what we do for our Weyburn builds and our incentive programs for the commercial incentive program. And then uh, we're looking at doing implementation of a new online payment on our website. Uh, so Laura did talk about a reduction in our budget. There was some internal payments we're doing for that. Also, there's going to be seeing an increase in uh, the community building fund. Uh, so that's actually funding we get from the federal government. Um, so we use that towards infrastructure. And right now that's towards our infrastructure revitalization program. 
uh, and also we're anticipating an increase in municipal revenue sharing from the province of Saskatchewan. Is there any questions on this before I move on? Go ahead. Thanks. Matthew, can, can you help us understand what records management means, uh, roughly kind of what that costs and what it might, the benefit might be, I guess. Yep. So I can speak to that. So um, right now we have budget $40,000 for records management. Uh, so right now we don't uh, have, we have a defined system, but we want to have a little more of a defined system. So a software program uh, where we as an administration um, secure all of our documentation. Um, we want to make it easier for us to follow and to find documentation. Um, so it's something that's being requested more and more from the province of Saskatchewan for a more defined program. Uh, so as me as, a, as administration, I've really seen a need to have that done to fulfill that requirement. Thank you. Anybody else? I thank you for this. Uh, as you see that we're moving forward with some of the technology, this e-payment is a, to me is a good thing to move forward because I've heard for some while now that people have asked that of it. So that's good to see that we're moving forward with that. And that's in the plan works. Next. Uh, so I'll move on to plan and development. Um, so it's kind of repetitive back and forth, but uh, this year a really big initiative for us is the offsite development levy initiative. Uh, so we started that uh, with our firm of Ontario uh, and we'll continue that into next year. Uh, it's a really important thing for us to look at how we do development within this community and really focus on that. And the second thing is what we see right happening right now in the community is construction of the Wayburn General Hospital. Uh, so that started. Uh, so what we do is class three building inspection. So this is a question we get lots from the public is that why are consulting fees so high within this budget? Um, so the budget is um, around $120,000 of that actually goes to a PBI, which is professional building inspectors. Um, so they actually do inspections of a class three building. We don't have that in house, uh, but we actually collect that back. So it's, it's actually a wash. So any money that we um, put in back to PBI, we actually get back from the people who are building on that site right now. So that's a question we get lots about that, that uh, side of that. Um, going forward for initiatives, again, the importance of the offsite development levy. Uh, so we're shooting towards a uh, spring or summer of next year to have that completely done and in front of council to review and provide direction uh, back to what they wanna see. Again, the hospital, we're quite excited about that facility finally starting. And, you know, I've heard lots of compliments about fifth being open up as well. So that's pretty good right now. Uh, and then electronic building inspections. Uh, we do paper right now for all of our stuff. And it goes back to what Mayor Roy just spoke about is, is getting with it now. Uh, and it's, it's going to be a limited cost for us there. But we're going to look at having maybe an iPad and have everything onto an, that kind of a system. Uh, we have a new building inspector in in house now um, so it's really good for us to have that lined up that way again um, it's a minor decrease of what we're doing it's not a big change of what we're doing for operations um, it's more of the status quo within that uh, department uh, but more i just want to highlight that when people look at our budget they say why is there such a high contractor fee that's why it's that level three person that we have to have come in but it is a wash that way and you will see that budget continue to get smaller and smaller because next year we will not have the um, offsite development levy and also we'll have less fees as we move forward with the hospital projects. So we're not gonna see a bunch of change that way. Okay, any questions on? Electronic building inspections, that will also uh, include getting some more simplified permits online. So right now, actually, Patrick is working on that within our departments. He's been reviewing some of our municipalities and he's working on getting some stuff that we want people to be able to go on to our website fill out the application forms and actually submit directly to us. Right. Sometimes when municipalities actually do the the permitting on online, it's actually you have to fill it out, print it off, and then scan it in. We actually want that they can fill it out and then send it directly to us. And that'll go to our general mailbox uh, for planning. Uh, and then there'll be an opportunity for not just Patrick, but whoever else is in that department to help assist. And uh, the big thing we always talk about is, is customer service and timing, right? And so we want to have a quicker process how we do, how we do those things. And again, that's where people have talked about, I say simplified things, smaller garden sheds that are just a little bit bigger and uh, decks, you know, so that they can just fill out the application, get it sent in and, and then get it back within a matter of a day or two. 
and that's what we're moving forward to. That's the, the focus we want to do is, is to, to streamline that process as much as we can, make it use more user friendly. Again, it's hard for people that they have to bring in a physical copy that they had to write down. We right. want to make it a little bit easier for people moving forward. And again, your uh, customer service is what we have talked about as one of our strategies here for this council to make better and make it easier. But thank you, appreciate that. Next. Or is that, sorry, sorry. Anybody else wanted anything on that? No, okay, go ahead. Okay, we're moving on to engineering. Uh, so some of the 2023 highlights. So we did an asphalt rehabilitation at the entry of the airport in the lounge area. So this is the primary location that STARS lands. Um, and this was funded partially through um, the community airport program. So it was a 50-50 uh, cost share on that. So the whole entryway at the airport was redone. And then uh, we did do some traffic studies at 16th and 1st, which was uh, done to establish exactly what was needed there for traffic flow, which is why we added the extra lanes. And then we have been doing engineering assessments of our roadways. So um, that was the traffic delays recently where you saw a rig that was drilling holes into the roadway. So we've been doing those preemptively so we can better understand how to repair the road and we can have um, a full report on it before we go out to tender so our contractors can fully understand the requirements needed for road repair. So in 2024 initiatives, uh, at the airport, we are looking to rehabil rehabilitate the taxiways. So our taxiways have degraded, which is basically the connectors um, along our hangars and also to our main runway. So we are going to do a rehabilitation on those. And once again, we will apply for cap funding as a cost share. And then also we are looking at doing the traffic studies at two different locations within the city and some engineering assessments again on the roadways. And another one that we have in the budget is a downtown revitalization conceptual plans we are looking at having somebody come in to design um, a full plan for the downtown revitalization that will engage uh, multiple uh, departments within the city as well as um, people in the public and businesses in the downtown so that's showing the increased cost from 2023 to 2024 questions, um, or questions on that if you yeah. could go ahead. Sure. Uh, Jen, can you help us understand a little bit more about the downtown revitalization project, kind of a time frame around it, and you know roughly what the budget you think this might look like? Uh, so next year will basically be um, consultation um, with business owners in the downtown, the public. Um, it'll involve the engineering department, um, public works, parks and leisure, planning and development. So um, we want to engage um, with the downtown users and the businesses and come up with a plan for what we see going forward for the downtown. And it will give us a map on kind of the different projects that can be done. Um, and it could be, we'll replace the sidewalks, we'll redo the asphalt, there's the undergrounds, but then also um, is there any um, kind of parks upgrades we wanna do from the different perspectives. So basically our timeline for next year would be to get that conceptual plan in place and then it can map out the investment that's needed over the next um, few years to determine how to revitalize the downtown. And I just want to make mention here too on it was good to really good to see what we saw with the uh, revitalization of the airport and, and sometimes people wonder why we we look at this airport we still still fairly well used but also too um, Medivac yeah. comes in probably three to six times a month. And I don't think people realize that besides stars, but mm -hmm. small planes come in three to six times a month and land here. And you have to have a certain caliber of airport for them to land. Uh, Kinders, Kindersley, no, Kipling, Kipling just extended their airport so that they could have them there. They were having to drive all the way to Brandon to get to get pa patients picked up. Now they were able to extend it so now they can land. raven has been very fortunate that they can be landing here all the time. So. Yeah, we are very fortunate with that, especially being in a rural area that we are able to provide those services for emergencies. So um, that was um, one thing that we've definitely uh, made a priority is having those services. Anything else, Jen, you want to talk about? No? No. Okay, next. 
it's me again. Okay. Uh, public works. <laughs> um, so some of our 2023 highlights. So we did a traffic light replacement at Government Road and Highway 39. Um, so with that one, we replaced all the lights as well as all the um, underground wiring and the controller there. Um, as well as we did multiple other projects in that area um, for catch basins and stuff when we did have the road shut down. Um, the replacement of the culverts under Highway 39. So um, a sinkhole actually discovered that the culverts under Highway 39 were failing. So we had a sinkhole on New Garden City Road. So we did two culvert replacements um, in conjunction um, with the Ministry of Highways. So that was a joint project between the two. And we got the culverts replaced because they were um, basically completely gone that um, there was potential for the highway to collapse in, so came a priority. Um, we also did sidewalk trip hazard repair and pedestrian accessible ramps. So we've been working our way through the city and this has been a continued uh, focus for us. So you would have seen them on Morgan Street, um, Government Road, and then Prairie Avenue were some of the bigger ones that we did. And then we uh, replaced the storm lines under Railway Avenue. So. You saw that we were quite busy on railway. Um, we have had some drainage issues in the past, and so we wanted to replace all the storm lines uh, under Railway Avenue in that 5th to 8th Street uh, section. So 2024 initiatives, we are looking at a traffic light replacement at Government Road and First Avenue, and this would be similar to the one we just did in 2023. We're also looking at a traffic light installation at First Avenue and 16th Street, so that is the second phase to that upgrade of that intersection. Uh, we're doing some asphalt rehabilitation. Um, so this is First Avenue and we're looking from Government Road to Second Street. Um, and that was part of the UHCP program. And then we're doing uh, additional culverts. We do have to replace a culvert under Highway 39. This is east of Government Road. So this was the third one that was identified through the studies with the Department of Highways. And that'll be a joint project again. And then we do need to replace the storm line on 16th Street from Cotto Avenue to East Avenue. Um, we are seeing failure in that storm line and so we need to have it replaced. And then also as a result of some of the flood incidents we have had, we are looking at some stormwater and wastewater system, system modeling and upgrades. And so we have applied for funding for this as well. Um, and this is to essentially um, see where our bottlenecks are and see what issues we have in the system so that we can upgrade them to um, prevent any flooding issues that we've had. Question. Jennifer, about the traffic light installation at First Avenue and 16th Street, is that part of the Urban Highway Connector program as well? So um, we are looking at applying to a different funding for that. You can apply under the expression of interest for that one, but then you would have to um, choose to not put one of your other asphalt um, install or uh, expression of interest in. And because the asphalt ones are of a higher value, we go after those ones. So we are actually gonna look at applying, applying to the traffic safety fund for that intersection to put that up. And that's a different um, grant program that's ran. So. We're gonna apply for funding, just not under UHCP. Perfect, thank you. Good. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Jennifer, the traffic light replacement at Government Road and First Avenue, I know you and I have discussed this before. Is there any possible way that we could look at putting uh, an advanced green there just because of the sheer proximity to the high school and backed up traffic both ways? Uh, so um, in the engineering um, department, I did have traffic studies in there and one of the traffic studies is for that intersection so that we can review peak times uh, related to the high school there and to see um, what would be uh, warranted at that intersection. So that is one of the traffic studies we are planning to do next year. Thank you. Jen, uh, back to uh, 16th and 1st again. Yeah. People would ask, and I know you've explained it to us, but why why didn't we apply for the funding for the traffic lights originally? It, it wasn't available, or we couldn't put it under the expression of interest, or? Um, so when we originally applied for the um, expression of interest at the time, there was no traffic study on there. So we did the traffic study after the fact, after we already had the money approved through the HCP and warranted uh, the additional lanes. So the city of Weyburn actually paid for those additional lanes to go in. And that's why we'll apply for the traffic lights um, in hindsight. Um, but yeah, at the time, it was just a rebuild of the intersection that was applied through for UHCP and we didn't have a traffic study at the time. When we went to do the rebuild, we decided to do a traffic study, which then created the extra lanes and then the traffic lights. So the funding gets approved basically like that year in advance of your construction season. So that's the hard part is adjusting once you actually get that of funding. 
And I'd just like to point out that like public works and, and the airport and that, a huge amount of grant work money comes in from the government for these projects. It's not just taxes alone that fund these projects, right? Yeah, we, um, a lot of it comes from <clears throat> Ministry of Highways and related to that, um, they run a lot of the programs as well as the Traffic Safety Fund. And then um, like the thing that we're looking at for stormwater and wastewater, it's a disaster mitigation fund. So um, our engineering department actually spends a significant amount of time applying for grant funding to ensure that we can lower our, um, lower our costs as much as we can. Good, next. Okay, that's still me. Uh, we'll go to fleet. Uh, so in 2023, um, some of our highlights is we added the new crack sealer unit. So we have been able to use this um, along our roadways, our pathways, as well as the airport. So this, um, you'll see it typically a lot more in the spring and fall when the cracks are opened up and they can seal them. Um, we did order an infrared asphalt reclaimer recently. We have not received it yet, but that will be um, received for the next construction season. We added an additional wide area mower to um, the parks department. Um, we have ordered a new water and sewer maintenance truck. It just has not quite arrived yet. Um, and then uh, we did upgrade to the fire department's command unit. So in 2024, the initiatives we're looking at is we are looking at an additional tandem dump truck. So we are finding that we could use this at the landfill for hauling cover, um, as well as we would use it um, in snow removal. That is one of the most contracted vehicles we have is a dump truck to haul to the dump sites. Um, and then another thing we're looking at is replacing the sweeper. It is um, about 12 years old now, so it needs to be replaced to continue on. And then also we will be adding a new mower to the parks department to ensure that they can meet the increasing demand in the grass cutting. Questions? Seeing none, go ahead. Next. Okay, landfill. Uh, so this year we did add mobile litter fences for the work area containment and to manage blowing litter. So um, we, this was a requirement on our permit to operate and basically it is, um, you can, they're quite high and you can see them, but they basically contain the work area and contain the litter as well as our surrounding perimeter fence. So now we have two levels of litter containment. Uh, they have had rave reviews from the people at the landfill as well as we have seen a reduction in litter that is blowing off our property. So we're quite happy with that. Um, we are also in the process of the design of the phase one engineered cell. So this basically we need to operate out of an engineered cell at the landfill and that is a requirement by the Ministry of Environment and our permit to operate. So it is a requirement in running our landfill. So in 2024, our, um, we are going to bring concrete crushing in. We do this about every two years and that's to increase our um, space at the landfill because any construction or the concrete that comes in from construction projects takes up a significant amount of space at the landfill. And then as well, we are going to start the construction of the phase one engineered cell, which is based on the design that we're completing this year. Questions? Seeing none, go ahead. All right, infrastructure revitalization program. Uh, so this is a new program um, that has replaced uh, local improvements over the past couple of years. So uh, 2023 highlights, so um, we replaced the curb and gutter and paved Fifth Street from Cotto Avenue to Prairie Avenue. So um, very much a thank to those residents as we took their street away for um, a couple months there, but it is very beautiful now. Uh, we also paved Fourth Street South at the River Park entrance. And then we did rebuild and add the additional lanes at 16th Street and 1st Avenue South. And then we did sidewalk replacements on Morgan Street, Prairie Avenue and Government Road. And then we did pave Brownlee Street from 1st Avenue Southwest to Sims Avenue. And that was an $800,000 budget. So we are targeting more in 2024. We are looking at sidewalk replacements at Cotto Avenue, 4th Avenue, Barber Crescent, 10th Street and Bison Avenue. We are looking to Asphalt Prairie Avenue from Government Road to Morgan Street. We are looking to Asphalt Railway Avenue from 5th Street to 8th Street. So that was the one where we replaced the undergrounds this year. We are looking to go back and fully rebuild that section uh, next year. We need to replace the curb and gutter and pave more street. 
And then also we are looking at doing some asphalt transitions on Government Road. So basically this is where um, the avenues are meeting Government Road. They've got those dips in them. So we're looking at actually um, milling those sections out and providing a better transition. And so we're looking at doing from 2nd Avenue to 9th Avenue South. Discussion. Thanks, Your Worship. Jen, I appreciate this. And I, uh, last year when we did this project, I think the overwhelming, when I say the project, the budget, I guess, uh, the overwhelming message from uh, that I heard anyways, and I think a lot of us did, was infrastructure was the priority for folks in town. And you've done a bang up job, I think, you and your department. So I, I guess my question is kind of two things, but both the same question. How confident are you in your ability to get all of the things needed to get these projects done next year? And how happy are you with the progress on the projects that you started this year? If I my department receives a budget, we will get it done. Get it. Um, we are very aggressive in our RFP and our tendering process. We are actually building all the information, collecting all the data based on what we have presented here, that if we do receive the budget, basically the RFP will um, be sent out basically as soon as we see, receive budget approval. So it can go out promptly and so that we can start at the very beginning of construction season. Um, um, and I think we, um, this year we had some amazing contractors as well as some amazing, amazing project managers and um, the whole city staff stepping up to assist contractors whenever needed. Um, so we are very happy with everything that went on this year. And I think um, we've established some really great relationships and I think have made some happy residents. I would agree. And I think the 16th Street intersection is a very good example of how well it worked considering, you know, some hurdles that yeah. were to say the least. So this is exciting. I think it's it should be what we do with our city. I appreciate it. Anything else? No, I was just gonna say that, and you can correct me on this one, but if uh, people may have missed it, that we're doing something quite a bit different on our uh, infrastructure here, that we're actually milling the streets down a lot and kind of making sure we're getting better roads as opposed to just laying an inch of asphalt on top and two. Yeah. So something that we've done is we actually on all roads that we are planning to come and do a rehabilitation, we also look at the curb and gutter. Um, and the big thing for replacing curb and gutter, despite the expense of it, is it, um, it, it, it basically makes it so you have proper drainage. And when you don't have um, your proper curb and gutter. If you don't have the proper drainage, basically that water gets into your roadway and it'll deteriorate it significantly faster than when you do the curb and gutter. So that's been one of our things is we're now putting in proper drainage and proper curb and gutter to ensure that when we do go back and rebuild these roads, that, um, that they are actually going to last longer. And so though, although that seems like there's a lot of money being spent on it, it's being actually we're doing for a long range term look at stuff and not just a quick fix look uh, make it look nice for a year or two correct yep okay. next kate still me i'll go on to utilities um so one of our highlights has been uh the construction of lift station three um so this one has been going on for quite a few um, years now um, through the design and the construction phase and it's actually set to start commissioning this week so um, this is a big one um, a big milestone for us so we are hoping for good weather and um, everything to work in our favor uh, this week for the commissioning out of that lift station number three so it was a replacing a 1960s uh, lift station. So it's it's a big project for us. Um, so the design of the upgrades at lift station one and Lagoon for flood mitigation. So this was step one um, based on the floods that we did have to go back and say where are bottlenecks um, because we did have to um, discharge lift station number one um, because it could not be handled at the Lagoon and at the lift station. So we um, have been doing the design there and we will be looking um, towards for that. And then we did a water remain placement on Railway Avenue and Duncan Drive. And then as well, we've done numerous replacements of valves, catch basins and hydrants. So you would have seen um, those going on around the city, which is part of our maintenance program. So then in 2024, we are looking at the construction of the upgrades at lift station one in the lagoon for that flood mitigation. So this year has been the design. Next year would be the implementation of that. 
we are looking at water main replacement on Railway Avenue and Moore Street. So Railway will just be a continuation on from where we were. So um, this section that was done was a 5th to 8th section. We will be looking at 8th to 10th going forward. And then as well as Moore Street, because it is set to be paved, uh, we did have a sewer replacement on that so we are now looking at doing the uh, water main before we replace or before we pave that street and then the continued investment in valves catch basins and hydrants and the biggest thing with these is we need to ensure that they'll operate when we need them so questions okay next me <laughs> i'm almost done um so next is the water treatment plant so we have had the commissioning and operation of CO2 and ammonia systems to improve our water quality and our compliance with our permit. So you'll hear me talk about uh, THM and HAAs basically um, because we pull from nickel, it's high in organics and we, um, during peak season of organics, we cannot meet the compliance with the permit for those um, those uh, components. So that was the first two steps with the CO2 and the ammonia systems. And then additionally, we've done repairs on Albert Douglas Dam as per the 2022 inspection. So basically, um, the dam is what keeps our water there. So that one needs to be repaired. So we are kind of now on a repair plan going forward to continue investing in that based on the inspection we did in 2022. <coughs> next up for the water treatment plant next year is the addition of powder activated carbon. So this is the continuation of the first two projects with the CO2 and ammonia. And this is to once again, lower our THM even further because we're, we're not quite there yet. So we knew this was a multi-phase project to see if we could get there with the two first pieces. Um, the thing with powder activated carbon is it actually can improve our taste and reduce our odor. So that is a, the third one in line to the um, improvements we've done in the past two years. And then we are going to continue our repairs on Albert Douglas Dam. So I would suspect we'll see those for a few years now because we've been spacing out the repairs. Questions? Okay, next. My turn. Give you a break. The bar is set pretty high here. Um, so uh, I will be going over the leisure parks and the facilities uh, budget highlights and initiatives for 2023 and 2024. Uh, so I'll start with leisure and parks. So 2023 highlights, um, we focused a lot of what we do on the uh, the new vision that's just been put forward by the city of Weyburn, which is a community for all. So you'll see through the, the leisure budget, um, both in 2023 and 2024, we've put a lot of emphasis on, on that piece. So in 2023, we focused on uh, getting the River Park Campground online onto an online booking system to modernize things there. Um, we expanded the Tatagua Trail um, and we di did some more maintenance uh, to the, the trail as well. Um, we have additional inclusive programming initiatives now taking place in the summer at both uh, the Weyburn Leisure Centre and the Spark Centre. Um, we've increased our newcomers programming and we've also transitioned uh, our swimming programming to the Life Saving Society, which was a major onboarding process. Um, and then also we're really focusing on creating new and enhanced partnerships with community organizations, with nonprofits and, and such. So in 2024, uh, some of the initiatives we're looking at, uh, we've seen an increase uh, to the regional uh, library per capita amount. So there's an increase in public library funding happening. Um, we're going to continue our high level of service that we're offering now and look to expand on those programs wherever we can through diversifying our our, our program availability and our approach on that. Uh, on the park side, we will be replacing the boardwalk pathway, uh, which runs along the river. And we're also doing some planning pieces in parks as well with uh, former Hag uh, school property, some uh, concept planning and some community engagement on that uh, parcel of land so that we can make some good investments in the future. Uh, so you'll notice an increase uh, to the leisure budget. Uh, a lot of the increase that we see is based off of uh, materials and supplies and wages uh, and utilities. Those are the big three. We do what we can through our rates and fees to, to offset those expenses as much as we can. And are we, we are budgeting for um, higher revenues uh, from our facilities. Uh, however, with all the increases that we're seeing it, with everything that we do operating in our many buildings, uh, we're just ex expecting some higher costs. Um, and that goes the same with parks. Uh, much of our increases there is on staffing as well as materials and supplies and whatnot. Um, 
we have up to 130 employees in the Parks and Leisure Services Department at peak season. Um, so uh, the recent increase to minimum wage and some other uh, things going on, we are expecting to see uh, higher wages going out next year. Um, the minimum wage piece in particular, we, have a, we, we employ a lot of young uh, students and young adults through our programs and through our facilities, and we're seeing a, an increase in there, definitely. Any questions? Thanks, Worship Andrew. I, I, I know you have this answer, but I just I need to hear you say it because we had the mountain bike folks in here a little while ago. Uh, please help us do more. You're adding Hague School now. Going to need more, 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 more. So what sort of? I, I mean, I see your budget increases here, and they're they're not insignificant. But um, on a I don't know, is it a three or a five year sort of lookout? Do you see that you're going to need a lot more, I guess, in terms of personnel, equipment, as our, because second only to infrastructure, the other thing we hear people talk about is our leisure services in our community, and not that there isn't enough or whatever, but just to keep them up and, and maybe do a little bit more all the time. So I guess I'm just kind of looking to what you think the next three to five years in your department is going to look like. Correct. Yeah, so there's always a balance that we have to weigh out with our services, what we provide and what we're capable of providing with what we have. Um, for parks in particular, uh, Jen mentioned in the fleet we ordered a wide area mower uh, last year. That was an additional mower uh, required um, for some additional mowing, one being the former Hag school property, the other being Riverwood as, as it onboards with the city as well. Um, we try to do what we can to partner as much as we can with our user groups um, at all of our facilities to try to lighten the load off the city. And we're, that's another piece why it's so important for us to increase our partnerships is try to um, engage those groups to assist us in fundraising and investments back into our facilities. Um, I don't believe that we're going to see a huge increase in staffing moving forward in the next three to five years. I think what we are doing, though, uh, moving forward here into 2024 is we are taking a hard look at our operations and trying to find all the efficiencies that we can so that maybe we can provide additional services without um, hindering ourselves too much. I appreciate that answer. Thank you very much. Andrew, you've talked about partners and user groups and those types of things, just maybe for um, the general public, what user groups have fees and what user groups does the city pick up the tab on when it comes to uh, the costs of maintaining and, and developing the property? Okay, so currently all, all user groups that use our indoor facilities pay a user fee, uh, which we set on a three-year rate review. I believe the next rate review comes up in 2025, so we'll start working on that and present that to council in 2024. Um, our current users of our field space, our field spaces, so our ball diamonds, our, our, our soccer fields, um, even our tennis courts to a degree, they are provided free access to those grounds. However, we do what we can uh, to have them contribute in some way. So you'll see Minor Ball consistently fundraising towards uh, facility enhancements, uh, that type of thing. So we try to... to um, to look after some of those future initiatives but with partnerships of those groups. But uh, so your minor ball, your minor soccer, um, basically any group using our park space is not currently paying a user fee per se. They are providing something back to us in other ways, uh, but they're not providing a per hour fee. Okay, thank you. And that just speaks to strong partnerships, right? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What else? I'm just going to say on that same note, uh, two things on that same note, Andrew, is that uh, we're quite a bit different than unlike uh, Regina, who charge user groups a fee for using the ball diamonds and that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're we're a very we have a very unique situation here in Weyburn, to be honest. Uh, we're one of the few in Saskatchewan that operate the way we do um, by not charging those per hour per capita fees back to those user groups. So um, it is something that we've built up through the use, through the years with, with those partnerships, but it is something that 
uh, we should maybe consider moving forward. Um, if we continue to see these rising costs, we need to find some revenue wherever we can just to invest back into our facilities because eventually, you know, if we don't stay on top of things, it could turn into a liability. Um, but with that being said, we also have to look back at the staffing question that I was just asked. And if we start charging hourly rates on our outdoor facilities, there may be heightened service expectations as well from our group. So we have to weigh that out. And that's where technology comes into play too, where you look at these robotic lawnmowers, where the, which cost the, you know, the price of, uh, half the price of what it would hire, cost to hire a student for the summertime to, to just buy and then it operates on its own so which is unfortunate not to employing but at the same time you're being more effective and efficient with your money that's that's going into it so things that we have to look towards the future through robotics and, and such yeah and we have a good group in our department we're always looking at what's next and how we can save a little bit money to go a little further um, even just with how we've digitized things lately is kind of a good telltale sign of how we've done that. So I remember seeing a robotic uh, floor cleaner in uh, one of the rinks in Calgary and just cleaning. So there's, a, and again, it looks, I know it's really, <laughs> you guys look over here smiling going, wow, it, it, but that's the technology that's out there and that's the technology and that's how they're saving costs on wages. As wages go up, they just switch it over to something else that works around uh, yeah. differently. They even have robotic uh, waitresses in some of the hotel uh, and some of the restaurants in China now. Yes, so it's, it's it's the way it goes forward. Next. Okay, so onto our facilities. So facilities and leisure, there's a lot that ties in together. However, uh, we also look after all city buildings. Uh, so the fire department, the public works building, city hall, um, basically all, all buildings other than the water treatment plant and then the lift stations of specialized public utility buildings. Uh, so just a, a few highlights from 2023, uh, some of the big ticket items. So um, Tom's Andy Sports Arena, and Crescent Point Place Chiller replacement. Uh, so we were able to replace the Arena Chiller, uh, 220 ton ammonia chiller uh, in time for the season. So we didn't miss a beat over there. Uh, it's been going well and we'll get another 25 years out of our ice plant thanks to that. Um, another big piece that we're looking at is our uh, ongoing roof replacement program in 2023. Uh, we had highlighted the uh, sports arena and the Sioux Line uh, Museum roof replacements. Um, so the contractor is actually just on site right now looking after the Sioux Line and or after the sports arena, sorry, and then they'll be moving over to the Sioux Line. Um, not listed in here, we also did some preliminary work at the library to get our ducks in a row so that moving into 2024, um, we can address the library roof, which has caused us some grief in previous years. Uh, so 2024 initiatives. Um, we are looking at some extensive long-term leisure planning and facility studies. Uh, so two of our facilities that we're looking to have uh, some engineers and architects come through and assess will be the Weyburn Leisure Center um, and Crescent Point Place. Uh, so we're going to do a, a full study on both facilities and try to identify um, current life cycles and where investments may need to go and what our plans are moving forward so that we can be prepared and start putting together something. Um, so if ever grants come along or uh, anything like that comes forward, we can take advantage of it. Um, and it'll also help us identify those immediate things that we need to look at so we can avoid uh, shutdowns in the next near future. Uh, I also mentioned it. So the library roof replacement, we have about $185,000 allocated to that as well. Um, over a large section of roof uh, that we hope to get done early in the, the spring. Uh, sticking with roofs, we want to assess all city facilities so that we can start identifying these issues uh, a, a little proactively uh, so we don't get rained on in our offices or in our common areas. Um, so we'll look at working through all city buildings with that. Um, and then we also need to wrap up the air handling and purification upgrades at the Weyburn Fire Hall. Questions? Okay, go forward. Next. Fire Services, Chief. Okay. 
Good evening. In 2023, a few of our highlights are that uh, we're contracted by the surrounding rural municipalities to provide firefighting services out in the uh, country and to buy time and prevent future damage and extensive damage to our city highway fire truck. We converted the city's old mechanic truck into a wildland firefighting apparatus. Uh, we acquired the use of the police side by side to assist with uh, wildland firefighting. So we had to acquire a trailer for moving that out to the country. As well, radio repeater to enhance radio signal in the area as our current system gave us no radio communications once we left city limits. Uh, we also acquired, purchased uh, a couple thermal imaging cameras to assist with life stability and finding hotspots, reduce time on scene, uh, and for victim survival. We also had to replace 10 SCBA air cylinders as they reached their life expectancy of 15 years. Looking forward into 2024, we are looking at buying four breathing apparatus. Um, we don't have enough currently. There is multiple fire trucks that don't, aren't equipped with breathing apparatus. There is cheaper on the market uh, that is rated for firefighting service. Though they are different brand names, nothing's interchangeable. So once you start on one brand name, you're married to that brand name. So that's that's what we're looking for in 2024. Questions? Thanks, Your Worship. I don't have a question so much as a comment, uh, and that's to commend you on your resourcefulness for that wildland firefighting unit. Um, last year you had it in your budget. Uh, it didn't happen and you were resourceful and I appreciate that, so thank you. Absolutely, and it's it's buying us some time until we can replace it, because uh, if we wreck our fire engine, they're not readily available and it would take us a year or more, if not, to replace that thing, so it's something we have to baby and take care of. No, nothing else, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Appreciate that, next. Police services. Your worship, councillors, your honor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in Chief London's absence, you have me. Uh, some highlights from 2023, uh, our CTSS vehicle, the Combined Traffic Services Saskatchewan, uh, finally arrived. There was a long delay, of course, with the COVID and, and the production of it. Uh, this one will be incorporated with the K9 kennel. Uh, specialized training, it's ongoing. Um, we have one DRE or a drug recognition uh, expert right now. We have two currently in training. They're in Regina and they'll be, they'll be going to Vancouver for the second part of their training here shortly. Uh, joint tactical support team, that's our joint team with Esteban Police Service. Uh, that is continuous training every month and annual recertifications. Of course, that's uh, uh, something that every police officer in Saskatchewan has to do. Facilities, repair and maintenance, uh, we had a couple issues in 2023 that were uh, taken care of the best we can and that's mostly to do with the air conditioning and uh, some of the boiler repair and maintenance. 2024 initiatives, uh, we have a, or we plan to have a new police vehicle. That would be the first one that the actual Weyburn Police Service has purchased in uh, approximately five or six years. Uh, facilities repair and maintenance program, the air conditioner needs a full replacement and uh, I believe the uh, collective bargaining agreement is on the table here very shortly. Members of the board and the association will be meeting very soon. And that's it from the Waverly Place. Questions? Mr. Janke? Or Mr. Van Betje first and then Mr. Janke. Brent, at a very high level, can you tell us why it's so important to have drug recognition experts? Uh, I think in today's world, it's very obvious if you uh, see the news releases and stuff coming out. Drugs, whether you think they're more prevalent, more dangerous, um, but they're far more in in the public's eye now than we're dealing with them lots. So drug recognition or experts, um, a lot of the alcohol driving, or sorry, impaired driving used to be based on what we had for tools to uh, test and I guess charge for impaired driving for the level of alcohol. The Instruments that we have now, whether it be the Drager or the Cetoxa, which tests for drugs, uh, the intox I should say intoxication by drug, is far more advanced. And drug recognition experts are just another tool in our toolbox to recognize that. That's great, thank you. 
Mr. Dombichi. Yeah, not, not a question, but thanks very much, Brett. And I'd just like to uh, acknowledge a couple members of our public from our police board. Uh, Ron, Met, uh, Ron McCormick is here, our chair, and Krista Hubick is another member. And then Barclay Charlton is also a member of the police board. So if you ever see them on the street, say hi and say thanks for their uh, dedication because it's not an easy job. It's a, it's a, it's a tough you. job and takes a lot of time. So yeah. thank them. And I did plan to introduce them. They've been my uh, support sitting here this whole time, but yes. <laughs> thanks, Mel. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or? No, we're good for this time. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Back to me. Yes. Um, so how will our tax increase of 650000 be collected? So 317000 of it will be in the mill rate on general operations, or for the general operations. 119 will be on the mill rate that um, an increase for the emergency services and snow removal. And 213 will be for on base tax. So that equates to a $50 increase in base tax. Um, the next slide shows what the impact will be on the average resident's um, home assessed at 300000 So it equates to about $10 per month, and it's about $70 on municipal tax and $50 on base tax. So a total of $120, which would be 10 bucks per month on the average home. And that is about it. So we're planning to have an open house on November 7th. Um, this is an opportunity for public to engage and provide some feedback. Um, budget discussions will be at the December or November 27th council meeting and delegations may appear. And we're hoping to have the final budget approved at the December 11th council meeting. Colton comments, yes, Mr. Hicks. I guess. From, from my perspective, I'd like to thank the management for putting this package together that we can take to the November 7th um, consultation because uh, it's in a great format, easy to read, easy to figure it out. Um, and then when you go back to one of the first pages, there's a huge challenge when the citizen survey comes back and it says we want to reduce spending, we want to maintain or increase capital and increase the level of service. So that in itself is a struggle. So I appreciate this and I look forward to the feedback from the residents. Mr. Richards. I would totally agree with what Councillor Haig said. This is a great presentation. It's it better every year, so thank you. Laura for that. I have, the question that I have, I'll, I'll direct it to the city manager and he may elect to defer to others and that's fine. Uh, my question is this, so we're going out to our friends and neighbors asking everybody for an additional $10 a month, uh, equals about $650,000 in new revenue. Uh, that tax increase will yield. So far, everything I've said is accurate? Okay, good. Uh, so I guess, I know this might be hard to answer, but can you give us a sense how much of that $650,000 is, is, is new services or is it new projects or is it simply, uh, and I, I didn't see, but I don't think there's any, or if not, there's maybe only one new position. So how much of this is going to say wages or salaries and how much of this is going to uh, services or, or projects? Thanks, Councillor Richards. So um, it's a mix. So I'll start one with the question about um, new hires. Uh, so a direction for us is, is always a higher level of service, but we have to look at, you know, it, it's hard to get to get those new employees in. Um, so there's only one new position in this entire budget, and it is uh, a summer student for parks. And it's just because of the level of green space that we're receiving over above what was been requested tonight. Um, so we talked about Higgs School, we talked about uh, the Riverwood development, um, you know, the, the increased usage in, in, our, in our park space. It's only one position. That's all we have. So there's nothing else we put in within this budget. Um, the other key things that you see is, is infrastructure. I think every presentation from every department was almost talking about infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. We heard it loud and clear uh, from, from you as council. We've heard it loud and clear from the residents is that they want to see more infrastructure. Um, the last thing is, is that a part of that increased funds is, is we do have uh, three collective agreements that are actually expiring this year. Um, we have uh, our QP, our fire and our uh, police all expiring here on December 31st. We will see increased raises 
um, within that, and that's expected, right? Um, and you also see that within our scope, that's all expected. So, so, so to answer your question as clear as I can, yeah. is that it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, the biggest thing we're seeing is what we're taking from the request to the tax base and even from our reserves for infrastructure. You know, you look at, and Jen did a great job tonight going through her presentation and she went through six different areas and, and every one of those areas talked about between our landfill to our to our water, to our utilities, to, to our roads, like it, infrastructure in, in all, all, all municipalities is, is getting to that point where you have to do that. And grant funding is, is there. And, and again, I appreciate the question asked about grants tonight. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the work that we're trying to do with both the provincial and federal governments to get more grant funding and the lobbying that has to happen from this council to, to have that happen as well. Infrastructure is a huge demand. So that's the biggest thing I'm seeing is, is one, infrastructure demand, and two is what we see just for the cost we have to do to, to make sure we maintain our staff and that we have, but we've made a conscious decision that we're not gonna add more staff. And it goes back to what Councillor Heggs just talked about is that you know you have those differing demands from what's happening and it's hard, it's hard. It's hard to get that level of service you wanna provide people. Um, we have a very strong staff um, all throughout the whole operations. Yeah and we wanna provide that level of service, but we also wanna make sure that our our operations are there as well, right? The tax base works hard for their dollars and we have to make sure that we provide what we have to back to them that way. Yeah. It's the most important thing that way. Before I'm done, I do also wanna thank um, Paige Tenvolt mm -hmm. for her, her presentation. She worked on this presentation, did all oh. this work with Laura. You told me you did this. <laughs> <laughs> no. If you I guys don't. know me by now, this is very far from me, but um, a really great job from, from them. And I also want to applaud um, all levels of our, our operations um, to take the work to do this. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into putting this budget in place. Um, we have changed how we do our, our budgeting. Um, you know, we want to have a little more open process. We also want to get things done so we can be able to purchase what we have to do moving forward. And um, uh, the challenge was provided Jen. Jen answered the question that I thought she would tonight is that, can you do these projects? Yes. And, and we know that there's a want right now to have that done. Um, and this is this is how it's going to be for the next little bit. There's there's an infrastructure deficit. There's a need for higher level service. And this is what we're seeing. Um, it's, it's not easy to, to, to go through everything, but there's lots of things we have to do as a municipality moving forward. I just want to, to kind of add one thing to, <clears throat> as I guess the, the, as mayor, the leading political figure here in Weyburn and, and, and Matthew, both of us go to these, the big city mayor's meetings. And at those meetings, we realize that there's a, a terrific amount of ins and outs on grants, on all that stuff. There's a lot of stuff. It just doesn't simply say, the government just doesn't hand over grants uh, easily to the cities. I was at one meeting and one of the older uh, experienced gentlemen that was there giving, talking about asset management said, years back, 1980s, 24 cents of every dollar collected in taxation in Canada was given to the cities. And now it's down to eight cents. So our federal governments, provincial governments have dropped immensely what they're handing to the cities. Not that they're not going to increase it again, but at the same time, we are at the beckon of what we are what we can do if we get more grants if say the gas tax increases the budget uh the premier decides that there's a lot more money in the budget a surplus of money they can hand out more money and we can get more things done within the city but we are basing our budget on what past results were and we are hopeful with anticipation for the future but at the same time this we are only we are a child of the government and that is most certainly uh, both governments uh, there, mainly the provincial, but also the federal government. And we can do only a certain amount of taxation. The city taxes only represent a, a small fraction of what can be done within the city here. Go ahead, Mel. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I'd just like to add that uh, I'd like to thank Matthew as the main steward and every uh, different department in the whole, in the city, I think, they do a great job. I think every year that I see they, they operate as efficiently as they can on the things that they can control. Most of the increases we have are 
are on, like say, additional infrastructure or projects and stuff that is just beyond our control, but the, the items that they do control, they operate as efficiently, I believe, as efficiently as possible, and they watch every dollar. Um, and that being said, uh, you know, I encourage people to come out on November 7th, uh, pose any questions, ask, you know, come prepared, and we'll show you what we can as plain and simple as we can so that you understand where the dollars are spent in your community. That being said, we'll move forward to inquiries and announcements. Anything? Yeah. Thank you, Worship. I uh, just wanted to send a huge thank you out to the community. The semi-annual book sale was held last weekend. Yeah. There was a lot of books and a lot came in and a lot went right back out. So thank you to everybody who volunteered. Uh, special shout out to Joanne Smith, who's the teen programmer. She had so many teenagers in there to help carry boxes and it made my life a lot easier. So thank you again. And uh, hopefully I'll have a proper total for everyone at the next meeting. Well, yeah, I, the, uh, earlier this evening we passed a, a bylaw for Sarah's school and I, uh, the, the people that are involved with this, I just thank them for their faith in Weyburn and I encourage them to move forward and hopefully they can get all the pieces in place because I think uh, what they're proposing is something that's needed in the city of Weyburn and I, I hope they're able to move forward with it as soon as possible. Well said. And one uh, final thing, we are cold weather coming in on the weekend, but our, I know the uh, Comp Eagles, they moved into the semifinals, they're gonna have their final game. Again, I, it's so great to see uh, our high school uh, team uh, being placed like third in Canada, and they are moving into the next round of playoffs to uh, play your old alma mater. You should be out there in your comp or your football jacket, Mr. Janky. Where are you? Then? Your Worship, I am pleased to report that my football jacket still fits. Oh, <laughs> and so let's whoever can make it and make the the cold. Who it fits? Yes. <laughs> he said it still fits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, but that is at one o'clock, I believe it. Uh, Darrow Cot Field, and so it's very. It was a beautiful foot, uh, day, last game, and so it was great to uh, go. And uh, very proud of all the comp school players doing this uh, here, leading, uh, putting Weyburn on the map in a positive way. That's most certainly for sure. Anything else? With that, I will no notice a motion, so I will call this meeting adjourned. If you'd like to share your feedback on the program you just watched, contact us today.